Kindly turn your Bibles to Psalms 27, and I'm going to read verse 1 and verse 14, the first and the last verse of Psalms 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. And he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. My child, don't give up. When you feel as if though you've run the last lap, stop and wait a while and catch your breath. Come rest in my arms. You will have those days when body, spirit, and emotions cry enough. When that happens, turn to me and wait. In due time, I will give you new strength. You will not only run with energy, but also mount up on wings and fly across the finish line. I initiated your race, and I will help you complete it. My child, I have chosen earthly vessels like you to hold my most valuable jewels because my light shines best in ordinary people. Others, full of themselves or with the cares of this world, have stuffed their jars so full there's no room left for me. Use my discretion wisely, my child. Sacred things are not to be trampled, but preserved. Share my treasures wisely. Don't hoard them, but give them to faithful disciples who appreciate the value. My child, never fear when you walk through fiery circumstances. A wretch failure, a business loss, an unexplained illness, they will come like unwelcome flames in the night. Don't be terrified, but look closely. In the middle of that fiery furnace, you'll see a familiar face. I'll walk through the flames with you. When I cannot utter the words, God, I know you are with me. Your presence is a comfort to me, even in my deepest pain. Thank you for being the one who sticks so close that your breath is my breath. Be my leaning post and hold me up so that I might be strong of body, of mind and body. Amen. The title of my sermon this morning is taken from the writings of the great reformer Martin Luther. A man who stood against the great uh, Roman Catholic Church of his time, who refused to bow down to the pressures that came from the political leaders as well as from the religious leaders. In his theology and in his own relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, somehow he felt that faith and doubt cannot coexist. Disbelief and doubt cannot coexist. And so he went on to say, to entertain doubt, to entertain disbelief in a Christian's mind is a monster of uncertainty. The reason why I chose is this, for the last few weeks, months, throughout this year, 2011, we have been looking into the various characters in the first kings, both kings and prophets, and have tried to draw some practical lessons spiritual lessons that will help us in a Christian journey. In the last meditation that we had, we looked into the first part of the life of Elijah the prophet. Here is a man of faith, a man of boldness, a man of courage, who was able to stand against the king of the northern kingdom of Israel and pronounce God's judgment. Here is a man who pronounced judgment not only upon the king, but upon the whole kingdom of Israel. And we saw how on Mount Carmel, the great mighty part of the Lord was exhibited. When the fire from the Lord came down and not only consumed the sacrifice, but even the stones, the wood, and even the dust. The Lord Jehovah's name was vindicated on Mount Carmel in the presence of 400 priests of Baal. And now the Lord commissions Elijah to slay all the 450 priests of Baal right at the brook Kishon. Now that the priests have been killed, once again the Lord Jehovah has been, has been uplifted and vindicated. The road was clear for the kingdom of Israel to experience a true revival and reformation. 
God's judgment has been executed. And now Elijah looks to the eyes of the people who had gathered on Mount Carmel and says, humble yourselves and return unto the law. My friends, here lies the secret for any one of us as Adventists, as Christians, as human beings to experience revival and reformation. In our arrogance, in our pride, there is no way that we can experience revival. It is only when I humble myself and say, it is all about you and nothing of me. Then we begin to expose our weaknesses and say, Lord, please forgive me of my shortcomings and allow me to be an instrument in your hand. And that's exactly why you find that Elijah the prophet looks in the eyes of the people who were shaken up, who were, who were embarrassed because they had let down their God, and he says, humble yourselves and return unto the Lord. The same faith that Ahab saw in Elijah when he walked into the palace, looked into the eyes of the king who was sitting on the throne and said, O king, as long as my Lord liveth, there shall be no dew nor rain upon this land for the next three and a half years. With the same faith now on Mount Carmel, he looks into the eyes of King Ahab, who was very much disappointed, defeated, crumbled, crushed. And he looks into the eyes of this king and says, get ready for a heavy downpour. Why? Rain that you have never seen, dew that you have never seen for the next three and a half years is going to take place. There's going to be a heavy downpour. For the land is going to be refreshed with rain. Mrs. White, in Prophets and Kings, page 137 says this. Elijah was a man of large faith. And God could use him during this time of crisis in the history of the children of Israel. And she goes on to say, as he prayed, his hand and face stretched out and grasped the promises of heaven. That's the kind of faith that we need to exercise in our Christian walk, my friends, in the year 2011. All of us experienced a great disaster for the first time in the Eastern Coast after many years. I think the last time this area experienced earthquake was in the year 1897. A great magnitude from this point of view, from this side point of view, not compared to the Western Coast. And now we are also going through, we are going to go through in another few hours' time, the great hurricane. Irene, and I, as a little student of the Bible, I'm convinced that this is not by chance and this is not by accident, my friends. I'm fully convinced deep down in my heart that God is shaking up, alerting us, waking us from our spiritual slumber and says, wake up, for my coming is very soon. If we have to prepare for the Lord, my friends, we got to experience a revival in our own individual hearts. There can be no other goal. There is no middle path. There is no other option. There is no other way. And so I believe as I prepared this sermon, even before we had the earthquake, that this is, very, is in tune with what is happening all around us. And so the message that God had for Elijah thousands of years ago, I believe very strongly, he has a message for you and me today. That we must wake up from a spiritual slumber and realize our shortcomings and ask for God's forgiveness and make our things right with one another and with God. So that's the kind of faith where your faith needs to be stretched out and be able to not return till God hears your prayer and answers your request. Consider the story of Abraham. At a ripe age, when he knew that his son is the promised son through whom a great nation is going to be created. Like the stars of the sky, like the sands of the sea. When the Lord commanded, you find that in Genesis chapter 28, that he agreed to go and offer his son Isaac, the only son whom he loved. He exercised great faith in God. How about, my friends, you look into the life of Daniel, when he was told to worship the king, or the image that was made, he refused because he had an unwavering faith in his God. Even if he was going to be thrown in the lion's den, he is going to remain faithful to his God. Such was the faith that he had, and the Bible declares, the angels came and shut the lion's mouth. How about Joshua, when he was asked to go around with the people, around the city of Jericho, he knew that he had no weapons in his hand to bring the walls to crumble down. But in faith, he did what God commanded, and he saw the walls of Jericho crumbling down. 
How about Peter? The only man other than the Lord Jesus Christ who was able to walk on the water. He stepped out of the boat, boat in faith. And he was able to walk on the Sea of Galilee. If not for a long period of time, for a short period of time. Because he exercised faith. You find that, you, you find even the case of you and me. Living in the 2011. We are looking forward for the Lord to come and we exercise faith, implicit faith, that if today, if not today, tomorrow, the Lord is surely going to come. And we need to hold on to the certainty. And that's the kind of faith that we need to exercise. Elijah and Mount Carmen. Tess Ahab to get into his chariot and to make his journey all the way to Zazril, the nearest town. It's almost 20 miles in distance. And as he proceeded with the journey, the Bible declares for us that there was a heavy downpour. And so the visibility was very poor. And the Bible declares again that Elijah was given that inner strength to run faster than the chariots and to guide the chariot right up to the city gate of Zazril. This morning it is my humble desire to meditate with you the second part of the life of Elijah. And we're going to see a great contrast. For in the first part of Elijah's life, we find a man of prayer, a man of courage, a man of faith, a man of boldness. He was able to stand straight and speak the truth. But in the second part of Elijah's life, my friends, as we look into the story recorded for us in 1 Kings chapter 19, we see a great contrast. And it is my humble prayer that as we meditate on the life of Elijah, the second part of Elijah's life, that we keep our ears open, our hearts open, to allow the Lord to send the right message to us. For I believe in a Christian journey, just like Elijah, we to go through great challenges in life. And there are three cardinal truths that I have derived in my meditation, in my prayer, as I prepared this sermon, that is true in every one of our Christian journey. And it is my prayer that as a result of meditation, that these three lessons will be always back of our mind as we face adversity and prosperity, as we face challenges and difficulties, that this is what great prophet of old Elijah faced, and this is how he was able to make it to the promised land. And if Elijah can make it with God's grace, with God's help, that I too can do the same. And so that brings me to the very first lesson that we can derive from the second part of Elijah's life. The first letter, my friend, is the, the frailty of mankind. I want you to turn your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 4. 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 4. And we are going to look into the last part of this verse. 1 Kings chapter 19 verse 4. And it, it is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. What a request to make. What a paradox. What a contrast. A man who was able to live by the brook Chirith for two years, have the most selfish bird, the black ravens to provide him food three times a day for two long years. A man was able to walk into a strange land, into the city of Zarephath, and to be fed by a widow who had just a small moss of flour and oil for the next one and a half years. A man who had experienced great wonders of God's working in his life. Now cries out to the Lord and says, Lord, what? Take away my life. The frailty of mankind. However close you might be in your walk with the Lord Jesus Christ, I want you to remind yourselves, my friends, that again and again, sometimes, our human nature comes to the surface. We fail to recognize our human nature, and as such, many times we have disappointments. But the first lesson that we need to derive is our Christian journey is a warfare. It is not a bed of roses. When Jesus said, follow me, he never said that I'm going to make your life smooth and easy. No, my friends, he said what? Take up your cross and follow me. There are going to be struggles. There are going to be moments that are going to be very disappointing. And Elijah, after experiencing great wonders in his life, knowing fully well that he did what God had asked him to do, now he cries out to the Lord, take away my life. A man of faith, a man of boldness, a man of courage, a man of prayer, 
A man who was able to stand and pronounce God's judgment into the eyes of the king. A man who saw great wonders, now he says, take my life. God was gracious to me. He honored his prayer when he uttered those words to King Ahab and never allowed the rain or dew to fall on the land. God honored him by sending fire from heaven and consuming the sacrifice on Mount Carmel. God honored him when he cried out after the sacrifice was consumed. Lord, send forth rain. And the Lord answered him and sent forth rain. The Lord girded him with strength to run faster than the horse, than the chariots. Now at the height of his glory, at the height of his victory, at the height of his intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, fearing to the words of the wicked queen Jezebel, that next day his life is going to be taken away, he cries out to the Lord and says, Lord, please take away my life. It's better for me to die than to live. Before we draw any hasty conclusions, consider the words of Apostle James in James chapter 5 verse 17. Apostle James in chapter 5 verse 17 he says this. Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. In other words, Apostle James, a very practical apostle, a very beautiful letter to read, says, do not be judgmental about Elijah. Do not draw your own hasty conclusions. For he was just like you and me. He had like passions. He failed, yes. He had disappointments in his life, surely. But he was still God's messenger. And so he reminds us, just like Elijah went through mountaintop experience, and then he's going through the deep valley experience, we too in our own Christian journey will go through valley experiences and also mountaintop experiences in our life. You will never be on the top at all times. For some reason, because of a sin, sin sick world that we live in, you will go through the valley experience. But we are not alone. Because Elijah, with God's grace, made it through. And if Elijah, with God's grace, can make it through, I want to assure you this, this morning that you and I can also make it through in the year 2011. In spite of what might happen around, in spite of the sad and gloomy news that you see, shattering news, so to say, we will make it through. Why? Because God is on our side. And that is what I find here very comforting. Yes, you see the frailty of mankind in the life of Elijah. But then through it all, the Lord was going to take him through. Consider the life of Moses, my friends. Another great stalwart in the Bible. In Numbers chapter 11, verse 15, he says this. And if thou speak thus to me, kill me, I pray thee. For I do not want to face my wretchedness. Again, just like Elijah, here is another great man of God. Christ out to the Lord because of the circumstance that he was in, because of the pressure and the stress and the anxiety and the worry and all the problems that he was facing as he was leading the children of Israel from the land of Egypt to the promised land. He says, please kill me, take away my life, for I don't want to see my wretchedness. In Joshua chapter 7, verse 7, another great tall word in the Bible, he cries and says, why has thou brought us over Jordan so that the Amorites can destroy us? He's asking a question. He's questioning the wisdom of God. In his desperation, in his disappointment, Joshua cries out and says, why has thou brought us over Jordan so that the Amorites can destroy us? Job, another great tall word in the Bible, in Job chapter 1, verse 10, he cries out and says, My soul is weary in my life. I'm tired of my life. I don't want to live any longer. David, another great favorite personality of the character that I, that I love very much to read about in the Old Testament. In Psalms 42, verse 6, he cries out, Oh my God, my soul is cast down within me. Words of desperation from these great patriarchs of the Old Testament. In Jeremiah chapter 15, verse, verse 10, we read, Jeremiah says, Oh, is me, for my mother has borne me a man of wretched, wretchedness. Crying out of desperation, out of disappointments. Let me pause for a moment and remind you, Elijah, who sought death, 
rather than life. Moses, who said, please kill me, are in heaven today, enjoying eternity. What does that tell us? The frailty of mankind is very real. What is the message I want to share with you in the first point? My friends, Christian journey is a warfare. Apostle Paul tells us that we fight against principalities, against prince of darkness. And as such, you will face weaknesses in your life at times. You might be down, but not out. I want you to remind yourselves. You might win a bad, you might lose a battle, but you have not lost a war. Because as long as you make Lord as your savior, as the pilot of your life, as the captain of your ship, I want to assure you that in spite of the weaknesses that might come out to the surface, that you are still the child of God. Elijah, when he cried out and said, Lord, take away my life, I want to remind you that he was still a prophet of God. He was still a messenger of God. And God had many more years for him to work for him. In fact, if you look into the story of Elijah, he had 10 more years to serve as the prophet of Israel. It's only after 10 years since this experience that Elisha takes over as the next prophet of Israel. And so God was not finished with, that, with him yet. God had many more things to be done and that is why he, say he was not willing to yield to the request of Elijah. Mrs. White again in Prophets and Kings, page 141, she says this. Elijah was blessed of seeing the evidences of God's grace working in his life. But he was not above the frailty of mankind. In the darkest hour, his faith and his courage forsook him. At the darkest hour of his life, his faith and his courage, Ellen White says, forsook him. And so, my dear members in the Lord, in the brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, when things do not go the way that you have desired, and as you planned, and as you have prayed about, do not lose heart, for you are still a child of the King. And God is still on the throne. And so the first great lesson that we can derive from Elijah is that if Elijah in his Christian journey, in his Christian warfare, faced frailties of human race, we too will face. There are going to be moments of discouragement. There are going to be moments of distress. There are going to be anxieties in your life. There are going to be worries in your life. And I must confess right now, otherwise my wife is going to tell me, you are not very honest with, with, with your people. There is never a day that I begin my day without kneeling, getting onto my knees and seeking God's guidance. Whatever the challenge that I as an individual face in life, I cry unto the Lord and pray and the Lord to intervene. But at the same time, in my weakness, in my frailty of humankind, I do worry a lot. And my wife reminds me time and again, you have prayed about it. You preach about it. How is that you still worry about it? That is my frailty, and I must confess that to you today. And if there is a message for you, there is a better message for me as a person. As I was preparing, I said, Lord, you are speaking to me. And I take this to my heart, that I need to work on this, not with my grace, not with my own strength, but with God's grace, that I need to stop worrying and leave it at the feet of Jesus. Frailty of mankind is the first great lesson that he derived from the life of Elijah. And that brings me to the second point. Kindly turn your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 19 and the very next verse, verse 5. 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 5. And as he lay and slept under the juniper tree, behold, then the angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. The first great lesson that we must learn that we will surely face in our Christian journey is that, my friends, the frailty of mankind. The second important lesson that I derive from the life of Elijah is the certainty of God's divine presence. I want you to know the story behind. Here is Elijah running ahead of the chariot, and as he reads Ezra, he gets the news that tomorrow, 
Queen Jezebel is going to go after his life. He is going to get him killed. And so what does he do? The Bible declares for us that in the darkness of the night, when the rain is pouring down heavily, he runs and he flees for his life all the way from Zazreel to Beersheba. And then out of his exhaustion, physical exhaustion, he's resting there. And what happens there? The angel touched him. Not a human being, my friends. The angel, at the command of God, comes down to assist, to help him. And he touches him and he says what? Wake up. And eat. Why? Your journey is long. Our journey on this world can be treacherous, can be very burdensome. But the Lord says, I'm going to be by your side. Yes, the frailty of mankind is there, my friends. But I love this promise that I find in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 5. It says what? The angel was sent down. The certainty of God's presence. In the hour of fear, of anxiety, of disappointments, of distress, of worries, of burdens that you might carry in life. I want you to be assured on the authority of God's word that God's presence is with you. What greater things can you desire in the worst part of your life than to know that God is by your side? Dear child of God, is there someone within the hearing of my voice, even the ones who are watching live? I know some of you by name, just like our congregation knows, that you have never been able to come to church in spite of the desire and the anxiety and the desire and the earnestness that you have because of your physical conditions and I'm speaking to your heart this afternoon and to the ones who are within the area of my voice within the four walls of this sanctuary have you reached the end of your rope in dealing with your troubles is your pain and hurt too deep that you're not able to bear it is your health condition so that it's being shattering your future plans is your financial security shattered you long for peace but all you face is turmoil on the authority of God's word, may I urge you, our God is a present help in trouble. Please hold on to this promise. And that is what God wanted Elijah to learn. Yes, you're running for your life. You're afraid of the Queen Jezebel. You think that she's more powerful than me. But I want to assure you by sending my angel that I am with you. That I'm going to take you through. That nothing can happen to you when I am on your side. When God is on our side, victory is sure and certain, my friend. It may, may, it may take time. It may not be to our timings. But may I remind you, God's timings is perfect timings. And so I plead with you, always carry with you the certainty of God's divine presence in your life. Whatever you might go through, good times and bad times, be well assured that he who created you, he who redeemed you, he who re sustained you all these years is going to carry you through. And Elijah needed that assurance. For his journey was going to be for 40 days long. For from Beersheba, he had to travel all the way where? To Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb. That's where he goes and hides himself in a cave. And the Lord says, I am going to be with you. In Genesis chapter 28, we have the beautiful story of Jacob, the deceiver. After deceiving his brother Esau and deceiving, deceiving his father Je Isaac, he runs for his life and he rests for the night in the wilderness, not knowing whether he's going to wake up in the morning. Out in the wilderness, with, with a stone as his pillow, as he's resting there, God gives him a vision there of a ladder connecting heaven and earth and angels ascending and descending giving him an assurance that God, even when he has sinned, even when he has cheated, even when he has deceived, that his presence is with him. What an assurance that we can grab onto. In Exodus chapter 14, the Bible declares that as the children of Israel moved from the land of Egypt to the land of promise, that the angels were behind and before the camp. They not only had the fire of cloud and the, and, the, and, the, and the cloud and the fire there, but they also had the angels in front of the camp and behind the camp. In Daniel chapter 3, we have the beautiful story of the three Hebrew friends thrown in the fiery furnace. 
while they were inside the fiery furnace god appeared to them and went around them and protected them in daniel chapter 6 we find that when daniel was thrown in the lions den the angels came and shut the lions mouth In Acts chapter 12 we have the experience of Peter being imprisoned in the pre- in, inside the prison and the disciples and the friends are the, are praying for him and what happens the angel wakes him up takes him out of the prison and delivers them that's the kind of god we serve a god who is a present help in trouble and so he looks into your heart today and he says Lord I'm with you always even unto the end of the world. He says to you today my child I will never leave you nor forsake you. For he knows your struggles more than what you know. He was never out of his mind. You were never out of his sight. And the Lord says cling on to the promise that I am with you always. And so the first challenge that we face in a Christian journey is the frailty of mankind. The second reality of a, in our Christian journey is the certainty of God's divine presence. And that brings me to the third important point. The third important cardinal truth about Christian journey. The necessity to focus on God's mission. Kindly turn your Bibles again to 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 9. We are going to look into the very last phrase of this text. 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 9. Let me set the stage for you to understand the context in which this text was written. As I told you that Elijah from Mount Carmel, he runs ahead of the chariot, goes to Jezreel. He hears the threat from Jezebel. He runs from Jezreel all the way to Bathsheba. There the angel of the Lord meets him and tells him to eat. And he makes a long journey, 40 days journey. And he now is in Mount Sinai, which is also called as Mount Horeb. And he's hiding himself in the cave. And it is here the Lord comes down and meets him and says, Elijah, what doest thou here? a question of concern may I remind you my friends the god that we worship is an omnipotent god an all powerful god the god with that we worship is an omnis omnipresent god he is present everywhere but i let me go a step further and reinforce in your mind that our god is an omniscient god is an all knowing god as such when god comes down to mount horeb and asks this question it is not for god to know the whereabouts of elijah It is not to get some new information but it was a question of concern for Elijah and for God's people in the wicked kingdom of the northern kingdom of Israel. And so he asked him this important question, a question of concern. Elijah, what doest thou here? We as human beings, my friends, when we ask questions, the purpose, the motive, the intention of asking a question is to get an answer. because you don't know it but when asked, god asked this question it is not because god was in the darkness my friends no god was concerned for elijah and for his people even for the ones who were not obeying him after he had exposed to the frailty of mankind that we saw in the life of elijah god assured him that my presence is going to be with you that i am going to take you through i am going to provide your physical needs and your spiritual needs and the lord says now that you have come to know now that you have been assured of my presence with you focus on god's mission why the time is too short we have no time to waste and that was the admonition that elijah was given by god himself for we are going to see there Elijah is beginning to make his own complaint try to make himself justified for the actions that he had done to flee away from the prophetic ministry that he was assigned and goes and hides himself in a cave and the lord says i like the way mrs white writes in page 115 prophets and kings he says it was it was i who commissioned you to return to israel and to stand against the false prophets of baal it was i who girded you with strength for you to run ahead of the chariots 
and she posed this question, but who sent you on this hasty flight into the wilderness? What errands do you have among the trees, among the plants, among the rocks? You're not going to preach the rocks. You're not going to preach these plants. You're not going to preach to these trees and shrubs. That is not where you're supposed to be. You are supposed to be in Samaria, warning the people of the coming doom and turning the hearts of the children towards the Father and towards God. That is the work that I've assigned you. That is what I call you into the prophetic ministry. And so God says, what? Doest thou hear? God were to ask that question to us this afternoon. What is going to be our answer? The lesson that I want to derive from this part of Elijah's life is this, my friends. That in my struggles and in my problems, I should still be on the Lord's business. I cannot sideline it. Just because I face, I cannot engross myself in my own my challenges and give up the burden that the Lord has rested upon each one of our shoulders to be the light of the world, to be the salt of the earth, to be his ambassadors, to be his witnesses. We got to do that all times. You cannot say, Lord, I'm having my own problems, so please leave me alone. No, my friends, God is telling Elijah, you have a work to do. And then the Lord says, come on, stand at the entrance of the cave and the Lord sends a great wind to rattle the mountain so to say but the Lord was not present in that wind he sends a great earthquake the whole mountain shook up so to say but the Lord was not present there then there was a great fire and the Lord was not present there and the Bible declares to me in a still small voice the Lord began to speak to Elijah the Bible declares, my friends, be still and know that I am God. May I appeal to you in the busyness of your life, in the commotion that is all around you, spend precious moments in God's presence, whatever the time you choose on a daily basis. In the quietness of the morning and in the quietness of the evening, all by yourself, all by yourself you and your God, and spend time in prayer. I just finished taking a course called as Christian Spirituality. And the lesson that I went through as I read the books that was assigned to us gave me a new perspective of what meditation is all about. The professor was trying to lead us to a point where when you read God's word and when you begin to pray, you got to first pray on what you have read in that portion of God's word. Because many times we read the Bible for the sake of reading and then we have almost like a parrot repeating, you have a long list of prayer lists. Our emphasis is not on what you have read from God's word. As one author says, when you pray, God is listening to you. But when you read God's word, God is speaking to you. And so when I open up God's word and as I begin to meditate and as I read, I should have my own mind open to allow the Lord to speak to me. And once the Lord has spoken to me through his word, when I get onto my knees, I need to be in silence. Says, Lord, is there anything more that you want me to hear from you? And then I begin to make known to God my request, my, my supplications, and my gratitude. Be still and know that I'm God. In the stillness of the evening or the morning, whatever the time, the Lord says to Elijah, Elijah, I want you to move from here. I want you to go and appoint Jehu as the king of Israel, appoint Hazel as the king of Syria, and anoint Elisha to be the next prophet of Israel. God had a work for Elijah. In the midst of his struggles, in the midst of his disappointments, in the midst of his fear, in the midst of his anxiety, the Lord says, you need to focus on my mission. I want you to get out of this place. Go back and do the job that I've assigned you to do. The necessity of focusing on God's mission in the worst of circumstances is a great lesson that we need to learn in our Christian journey. Don't 
ever take leave a vacation from witnessing for the Lord. Every minute of our life, through our actions, through our words, and even through our thinking, we got to witness for the Lord. And more so in the time that we live in, my friends, as I told you in my introduction, the natural calamities that are taking place in great frequency and intensity all around the world, even around us. The economical world that is collapsing. America, the, the richest nation in the world, economically, is now the greatest debtor in the world, so to say. In fact, I was amazed to hear that almost 60 to 70 percent of the money that this country has borrowed is from the Asian countries. China, India, Japan have loaned this country almost more than $14 million, trillion dollars in debt. What does it tell us? Economical security is no guarantee. Look at the social world. Look at the political world. Obama's rating is 38%. And yesterday I was reading that the Congress, their approval rating is 12%. 88% of the people in this country do not have any trust in the senators and the, uh, and the representatives that we have. People have lost faith in people. Economically, we are just collapsing. Socially, there is so much of disorder. In the natural world, there is so much of calamities. Do not stand back and take it easy, my friends. Wake up from your spiritual slumber. Because we need to realize that surely and certainly we are living at the end of time. Soon and very soon, we will see the king. John, the great revelator then, who wrote the book of John, the, episode, the gospel, and also the three letters, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. In 1st John chapter 3, verse 2, he says, For we will see him as he is. William Dyke lost his eyesight at the age of 10. But in spite of his handicap, he proved to be a very intelligent and a very handsome young man. His father sent him to England to study for his graduate school. And so while he was doing his graduate studies, he fell in love with, a, with an young lady who was the daughter of the English admiral. And so it was almost time for them to get married. And before the marriage could take place, the daughter, the girl's father, turned to William Dyke and said, William, I have one request to make. I wish my daughter had married somebody who had eyes to see but I'm not going to question her dedication and her love for you. But I want you to just follow one instruction. Please allow me to use my influence and my money for you to go through a surgery for your eyesight. For you see, my friends, now he's almost 25. For the last 15 years, he has been blind. He had never seen things around. He had only felt it. He heard about it, but never saw with his own naked eyes, for he was blind. Because he loved his girlfriend so deeply he was willing to take the chance. And so he allowed the surgery to take place. But then the father to be father told him, but one thing, we will remove the bandage around your eyes and around your head only on the wedding day. As you stand inside the sanctuary and as, you, as the music, the piano is going to play the music, as the bride is going to walk through, it is then that we are going to remove the bandage. And William Dyke agreed to that. And so as he stood on the day after the surgery was done, and as the music began to play, and as the admiral began to bring his daughter down the aisle, people standing in quietness, William Dyke's father walked up to the stage and slowly began to remove the bandage that was around his eyes and around his head. By the time he removed it, his beautiful bride was just right in front of him. And when he opened his eyes, the first thing he saw was his beautiful bride. Tears of joy began to flow down his cheeks. For he had talked to her, he had spent precious moments with her, but he had never seen the beauty of his bride, of his to-be wife. But for the first time, when his eyes opened, he saw and tears of joy began to roll down his cheeks. Likewise, my friends, soon and very soon, we are going to see the bridegroom, our Lord Jesus Christ. Not as Apostle Paul says, now we see dimly, but a day is going to come very soon when we can see him face to face. 
It's not going to be the beauty like the world describes. But I'm going to admire my master because of the scars that I find on his hands. I'm going to admire because of the scars that I'm going to see on his feet. Because those scars were made, was sacrificed because of me, a sinner. Because of you, a sinner. Those were the nails that was pierced through his hand and through his feet as he died on the cross of Calvary and said, It is done. God has won the victory, my friends. And so God is going to come very soon. And we need to be anxiously waiting to be ushered in to the glorious kingdom called Jerusalem. John saw the city and he could beheld the golden throne. John saw the city of crystal sea around the throne in heaven. God saw the city where he saw the lamb and the lion sitting side by side. God, John saw a city where the saints were worshipping and saying, worthy, worthy is the lamb. John saw a city that was streets of gold. I want to be in the city. I want you, every one of you within the hearing of my voice and the ones watching live, to be in the city called Jerusalem.